Hey guys, welcome back to another True Crime Thursday. Today I'm going to be talking about Jack the Ripper. Now literally everyone knows Jack the Ripper. I'm not going to be going over every single suspect because there are literally hundreds. So I'm going to go over the basic storyline of the case rather than going over individual suspects. If you'd like more detailed description, there are probably hundreds of documentaries on this guy, but I thought I would give it an overview for anyone who doesn't know who he is. All right, let's get into it. In the mid 19th century, Britain experienced an influx of Irish immigrants who swelled the populations of major cities, including the East End of London. From 1882, Jewish refugees fleeing pogroms in terraced Russia and other areas of Eastern Europe immigrated into the same area. The parish of Whitechapel in London's East End became increasingly overcrowded, with the population increasing to approximately 80,000 inhabitants by 1888. Work and housing worsened and a significant economic underclass developed. 55% of children born in East End died before they were five years old. Ooh. Robbery, violence, and alcohol dependency were commonplace, and the endemic poverty drove many women to prostitution to survive on a daily basis. In October 1888, London's Metropolitan Police Service estimated that there were 62 brothels and 1,200 women working as prostitutes in Whitechapel, with approximately 8,500 people residing in the 233 common lodging houses within Whitechapel every night. The economic problems in Whitechapel were accompanied by a steady rise in social tensions between 1886 and 1889. Frequent demonstrations led to police intervention and public unrest. Anti-Semitism, crime, nativism, racism, social disturbance, and severe deprivation influenced public perceptions that Whitechapel was a notorious den for immorality. Such perceptions were strengthened in the autumn of 1888 when the series of vicious and grotesque murders attributed to Jack the Ripper received unprecedented coverage in the media. For the rest of the video, I'll do my normal voice so I don't scar you or scar you, um, distract you. <laughs> if you would like me to do a British accent next time I have a British case, I will definitely do so. <laughs> In the East End, during this time, adds uncertainty to how many victims were murdered by the same individual. 11 separate murders stretching from April 3rd, 1888 to February 13th, 1891 were included in a London Metropolitan Police Service investigation and were known collectively in the police docket as the Whitechapel murders. Opinions vary to whether these murders should be linked to the same culprit, but five of the 11 Whitechapel murders, known as the Canical Five, are widely believed to be the work of Jack the Ripper. Most experts point to deep slash wounds to the throat, followed by extensive abdominal and genital area mutilation, the removal of internal organs, and progressive facial mutilations as the distinctive features of the Ripper's modus operandi. The first two cases in the Whitechapel murders file, those of Emma Elizabeth Smith and Martha Tabram, are not included in the Canical Five. So these two women were murdered, which by the way, I won't go into detail, but not pretty. Then there were the Canical Five. The Canical Five Ripper victims are Mary Ann Nichols, Annie Chapman, Elizabeth Stride, Catherine Endows, and Mary Jane Kelly. The body of Mary Ann Nichols was discovered at around 3.40 a.m. on Friday, August 31st, 1888, in Bucks Row, which is now Dewart Street in Whitechapel. Nichols had been seen alive approximately one hour before the discovery of her body by a Miss Emily Holland, who, with whom she previously shared a bed at a common lodging house in Thrall Street, Spitfields, walking in the direction of Whitechapel Road. Her throat was severed by two deep cuts on which one of them severed all the tissue down to her vertebrae. Her no-no square had been stabbed twice, and the lower part of her abdomen was partially ripped open by a deep, jagged wound, causing her bowels to protrude. So several other incisions inflicted to both sides of her abdomen had also been caused by the same knife. Each of these wounds had been inflicted in a downward thrusting motion. On Saturday, 
September 8, 1888, the body of Annie Chapman was discovered at approximately 6 a.m. near the steps to the doorway of the backyard of 29 Hanbury Street, Spitzfields. As in the case of Marianne Nichols, the throat was severed by two deep cuts. Her abdomen had been cut entirely open, with a section of flesh from her stomach being placed upon her left shoulder, and another section of skin and flesh, plus her small intestines, being removed and placed above her right shoulder. Chapman's autopsy revealed that her uterus and sections of her bladder and no no square had been removed. The inquest into Chapman's murder. Elizabeth Long described having seen Chapman standing outside 29 Hanbury Street at about 5.30 a.m. in the company of a dark-haired gentleman wearing a brown deer stalker hat and dark overcoat with a shabby genteel appearance. According to this eyewitness, the man asked Chapman the question, Will you? to which Chapman had replied, Yes. Elizabeth Stride and Catherine Endows were both killed in the early morning hours of Sunday, September 30th, 1888. Stride's body was discovered at approximately 1 a.m. in Dutfield's yard off Burner Street, which is now Henrique Street in Whitechapel. The cause of death was a single clear incision measuring six inches across her neck, which severed her left carotid artery and her trachea before terminating beneath her right jaw. The absence of any other furtive mutilations to her body has led to uncertainty if it was Jack the Ripper or maybe that he was interrupted. Several witnesses later informed police they had seen stride in the company of a man in, a, in or close to Burner Street on the evening of September 29th and the early morning hours of September 30th but each gave differing descriptions of this man, which did not help. Um, some said he was fair, others said dark, some said he was shabbily dressed, while others said he was nicely dressed. So, unless he is a, a freaking shapeshifter, that's a problem. Endow's body was found in Mitre Square in the city of London, three quarters of an hour after the discovery of the body of Elizabeth Stride. Her throat was severed and her abdomen ripped open by a long, deep, jagged wound before her intestines had been placed over her right shoulder. The left kidney and major part of the uterus had been removed, and her face had been disfigured with her nose severed, her cheeks slashed, and cuts measuring a quarter of an inch and a half, respectively, vertically incised through each of her eyelids, a triangular incision, the apex of which pointed toward Endow's eye, had also been carved into each of her cheeks, and a section of her auricle and lobe of her right ear were later discovered in her clothing. The police surgeon who conducted the post-mortem upon Endow's body stated his opinion that these mutilations were taken would have taken at least five minutes. I'm sorry. That sucks, man. A local cigarette salesman named Joseph Lonnend had passed the square with two friends shortly before the murder. He described seeing a fair-haired man of shabby appearance with a woman who may have been in doubts, but of course he doesn't really know. Lundell's companions were unable to confirm his description. The murders of Stride and Endows ultimately became known as the double event. A section of Endow's bloodied apron was found at the entrance to a tenement in Golston Street, Whitechapel, at 2.55 a.m. A chalk inscription upon the wall directly above this piece of apron read, The Jews are the men that will not be blamed for nothing. This graffiti became known as the Golston Street graffiti. The message appeared to imply that a Jew or Jews in general were responsible for the series of murders but it is unclear whether the graffiti was written by the murderer or the apron just dropped there, the killer dropped it there, and then it was a coincidence. They don't know. Such graffiti was commonplace in Whitechapel. Police Commissioner Charles Warren feared the graffiti might spark anti-Semitic riots and ordered the writing to be washed away before dawn. The extensively mutilated and disemboweled body of Mary Ann Kelly was discovered lying on a bed in a single room where she lived at 13 Miller's Court off Dorset Street in Spitzfields at 10.45 a.m. on Friday, November 9th, 1888. Her face had been hacked beyond all recognition, with her throat severed down to the spine and the abdomen almost emptied of its organs. Her uterus, kidneys, and one breast 
had been placed beneath her head, and other viscera from her body placed beside her foot, and sections of her abdomen and thighs upon a bedside table. The heart was missing from the crime scene. Each of the Canical Five murders were perpetrated at night, on or close to a weekend, either at the end of a month or a week or so after. The mutilations became increasingly severe as the series of murders proceeded, except for that of Stride, whose attacker may have been interrupted. Nichols was not missing any organs. Chapman's uterus and sections of her bladder and Nono Square were taken. And Dow's had her uterus and left kidney removed and her face mutilated and Kelly's body was extensively eviscerated, with her face gashed in all directions, and the tissue of her neck being severed to the bone, although the heart was the sole organ missing from the crime scene. Historically, the belief these five canonical murders were committed by the same perpetrator is derived from contemporary documents which link them together to the exclusion of others. In 1894, Sir Melville Magnaughton, assistant chief constable of the Metropolitan Police Service and head of the Criminal Investigation Department wrote a report that stated the Whitechapel murderer had five victims and five victims only. Similarly, the Canical Five were linked together in a letter written by police surgeon Thomas Bond to Robert Anderson, head of the London CID, on November 10, 1888. Some researchers have posited that some of the murders were undoubtedly the work of a single killer but an unknown larger number of killers acting independently were responsible for the other crimes. Authors Stuart P. Evans and Donald Rumbelow argue that the Canonical Five is a ripper myth and that three cases, Nichols, Chapman, and Endows, can definitely be linked to the same perpetrator, but that l less certainty exists as to whether Stride and Kelly were also murdered by the same man. Conversely, others suppose that the six murders between Tabram and Kelly were the work of a single killer. So, including one of the first ones to the, with the Canical Five. Dr. Percy Clark, assistant to the examining pathologist George Bagster Phillips, linked only three of the murders and thought that the others were perpetrated by weak-minded individuals induced to in emulate the crime. After the Canical Five, there were four more victims that were that were joined in with the Whitechapel murder title. Mary Jane Kelly is considered the final victim of the Ripper, and it is assumed that the crimes ended because of the culprit's death, imprisonment, inst institutionalization, immigration, pretty much anything. The Whitechapel murders file details another four murders which occurred after the Canical Five. There was Rose Millette murdered December 20th, 1888. Police believed that she had either accidentally hanged herself with her own collar while in a drunken stupor or committed suicide. She was found strangled. But there was evidence that of a court that could be someone else strangled her. Alice McKenzie on July 17th, 1889, suffered two stab wounds to her neck and her left carotid artery had been severed. Several minor bruises and cuts were found on the body, which also bore a 7-inch long superficial wound extending beneath her left breast and her navel. So they're like, Ooh. Then there was the Pynchon Street torso on September 10th, 1889. It was a decomposing headless and legless torso of an unidentified woman aged between 30 and 40 years old discovered beneath a railroad arch in Pynchon Street, Whitechapel. Bruising about the victim's back, hip, and arm indicated that she was beat up before being cut into pieces. The victim's abdomen was also extensively mutilated, although her genitals had been left alone. She appeared to have been killed approximately one day prior to being found. Lastly, Frances Cole was murdered on February 13, 1891, at 2.15 a.m. on February 13th. P.C. Ernest Thompson discovered Frances lying beneath a railroad arch at Swallow Gardens, Whitechapel. Her throat had been deeply cut, but her body was not mutilated, leading some to believe that Thompson had disturbed her assailant. Coles was still alive, although she died before medical, or medical help could arrive. A 53-year-old stoker, James Thomas Sadler, had 
earlier been seen drinking with Coles, and the two are known to have argued pr approximately three hours before her death. Sadler was arrested by police and charged with her murder. He was briefly thought to be the Ripper, but was later discharged from court for lack of evidence on March 3, 1891. The vast majority of the City of London police files relating to the investigation into the Whitechapel murders was destroyed in the Blitz, which is a German, German bombing during World War II. The surviving Metropolitan Police files allow a detailed view of investigative procedures in the Victorian era. A large team of policemen conducted house-to-house -house inquiries through Whitechapel. Forensic material was collected and examined. Suspects were identified, traced, and either examined more closely or eliminated from the inquiry. Modern police work follows the same pattern. More than 2,000 people were interviewed, upwards of 300 people were investigated, and 80 people were detained. Following the murders of Stryden and Dowes, the Commissioner of the City of Police, Sir James Fraser, offered a reward of £500 for the arrest of the Ripper. Butchers, slaughterers, surgeons, and physicians were suspected because of the manner of the mutilations. A surviving note from Major Henry Smith, acting commissioner of the city police, indicates that the alibis of local butchers and slaughterers were investigated, with the result that they were eliminated from the inquiry. A report from Inspector Swanson to the Home Office confirms that 76 butchers and slaughterers were visited, and that the inquiry encompassed all their employees for the previous six months. So they went ham on investigating. Good with them. Most police during this time suck ass. At least they tried. Some contemporary figures, including Queen Victoria, thought the pattern of the murders indicated that the culprit was a butcher or cattle driver on one of the cattle boats that piled between London and mainland Europe. Whitechapel was close to the London docks, and usually such boats docked on Thursday or Friday and departed on Saturday or Sunday. The cattle boats were examined, but the dates of the murders did not coincide with a single boat's movements, and the transfer of a crewman between boats was also ruled out. At the end of October, Robert Anderson asked police surgeon Thomas Bond to give his opinion on the extent of the murderer's surgical skill and knowledge. The opinion offered by Bond on the character of the Whitechapel murderer is the earliest surviving offender profile. Bond's assessment was based on his own examination of the most extensively mutilated victim and the post-mortem notes from the four previous canonical murders. He wrote, All five murders are no doubt were committed by the same hand. In the first four, the throats appeared to have been cut from left to right. In the last case, owing to the extensive mutilation, it is impossible to say in what direction the fatal cut was made. But arterial blood was found on the wall and splashes close to where the woman's head must have been lying. All the circumstances surrounding the murders lead me to form the opinion that the women must have been lying down when murdered, and in every case, the throat was first cut. Bond was strongly opposed to the idea that the murderer possessed any kind of scientific or anatomical knowledge, or even the technical knowledge of a butcher or horse slaughterer. In his opinion, the killer must have been a man of solitary habits, subject to periodical attacks of homicidal and erotic mania, with the character of mutilations possibly indicating Seatris. Bond also stated that the homicidal impulse may have developed from a revengeful or brooding condition of the mind, or that religious mania may have been the original disease, but he does not think either hypothesis is likely. There is no evidence the perpetrator engaged in sexual activity with any of the victims, yet psychologists suppose that the penetration of the victims with a knife and leaving them on display in sexually degrading positions with the wounds exposed indicates that the perpetrator derived sexual pleasure from the attacks. The view is challenged by others who dismiss such hypothesis as in support of su supp supposition. In addition to the contradictions and unreliability of com contemporary accounts, attempts to identify the murderer are hampered by the lack of any surviving forensic evidence. DNA analysis on extant letters is inconclusive. The available material has been handled many times and is too contaminated to prove meaningful results. The concentration of the killings around weekends and public holidays and within a short distance of each other has indicated to many that the Ripper was in regular employment and lived locally. Others have thought the killer was educated upper-class man, possibly a doctor or an aristocrat, who ventured into Whitechapel from a more well-to-do area. Such theories draw on cultural perceptions such as fear of the medical profession, mistrust of modern science, or the exploitation of the poor by the rich.
Suspects proposed years after the murders include virtually anyone remotely connected to the case. To conclude, this case, I hate it. <laughs> I hate it on many levels. I hate it because the, the murders are so gruesome and these women were alive when this happened. And if it was true and their throats were cut first, they died quite quickly. Now, I don't know if he did the other things to them while they were still choking on their own blood or if they were already dead. I don't know if they knew that. That file might have been destroyed in the Blitz. It may not have even been known, but not cool. Especially the last one. Nightmares forever. Secondly, because it's so old and because of all the evidence being contaminated and things being lost, there's there's a big chance that we're never gonna figure out who this guy is. He might have done all 11. He may have only done two, for all we know. I didn't go over it, but there were letters that were also sent to newspapers and other people. Many of them think that they were just people messing with others. But some of them were a little detail where you're like, hmm, interesting. I really wish we could figure out who this guy is. I didn't go over any suspects' names because there are literally hundreds. There are a main few that many people go to as the suspect for the killings. If you would like more details on that, I would suggest going and watching a documentary because there's literally hundreds of them. This guy fucked up. If he did all that, even if he only killed the five, screwed up, dirty ass mind, he has a problem against women because that is passionate. Doing something like that is really passionate which means that he just did not like women or specifically did not like prostitutes because they were all in the poor end of the city and they all, I'm pretty sure, were prostitutes or of that nature. So, I don't know. It's interesting. I really wish we could figure out who it is, but I don't know if we ever will. I hope you guys enjoyed as much as you can enjoy a story like this. I will be back next Thursday with another True Crime Thursday and Monday with whatever I set, decide to post. And because it's December, Christmas month, I'm going to be also posting on Saturday. So you'll be expecting a video in a few days. You're welcome. <laughs> All right. See you later, guys. Whew.